Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, uh, and welcome to the eighth uh, Capitalism and Morality Seminar. Uh, this seminar uh, is structured to um, make us think and contemplate. This is not an activist seminar. Uh, and the reason I started this seminar eight years back was that I wanted to keep revisiting the values of the Western civilization, the only civilization I have known in my life. Uh, governments around the world for many decades are getting increasingly repressive. Uh, unfortunately, sociopaths get into power because the otherwise nice guy on the street carries with him, within him the poison of totalitarianism. He likes to run lives of other people. He mostly fails to realize that the poison he generates leads to a totalitarian state. Our institutions, in my view, are merely a symptom of our culture. And that is why the speakers are invited to talk about our cultures and our Western values so that we can work on our culture. We have a very long day today. I have often heard complaints from the audience because the day is usually tight. Today, it's tighter than ever. Um, <laughs> I will keep my introductions very short. Um, our first speaker is Dana Martin. She is here for the second time. She has been speaking and writing about natural birth, attachment parenting, and unschooling. She's the author of uh, two books, Radical Unschooling, A Revolution Has Begun, begun and her recent book is Radical Birth. Um, and uh, the movement of and schooling is growing tremendously because of her efforts. She is going to talk about why punishments and rewards model a hypocritical morality to children and what to do instead. Dana Martin. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. This is my second year here. The first year, um, I think it was one of the first times I ever traveled alone. I have four kids, and for the last 10 years, whenever I'd go to speak, my kids would come with me because they were really little and they didn't want to be away from me. So I can remember coming here three years ago, actually, and it being so freeing. It was, it was like a rite of passage to travel here alone, and it's such a long journey from New Hampshire. So I got to do that again, and I went out sightseeing which was another really awesome thing to do yesterday. So I'm really grateful to be here. The audience last time was so wonderful, and I made so many great connections and friends that I've maintained the friendships with since that time, and it's um, branched off to other opportunities and other just ways of advocating what I do. A couple days ago, my kids and I were sitting down, we were watching a television show and a commercial came on. I wanted to share this with you guys. I haven't shared it with anybody before, but you may or may not have seen the commercial. It's a Subaru commercial series. And in the commercial series, there it, it's about teenagers and, ha and driving and them getting in accidents. So I was watching this commercial and one of the teenagers got in a minor accident and called his parents and he was so afraid of getting in trouble, getting punished. That was the focus of the commercial, was teens and punishment. And the first thing the parents said is, you're grounded for a month. And he said, okay, thank you, that, that's all. I Thank you for my punishment, and I'm going to my room now. And I was thinking about it, and I wanted to tie it into this because, isn't it interesting when we live in the authoritarian paradigm with children and teens, people don't realize what that creates within them. It turns them very self-focused. Anyone who, who's ruled over, their concern becomes them and them only. And it's a natural reaction to control and punishment and power ruling over you. And so the teen, his only concern was if he was going to get in trouble. So basically, what freedoms would he lose from this minor fender bender? As opposed to what we'd love to instill in our children, and that's caring about the car and, and letting the parents know that, that they're okay. And you know, apologizing and caring about the parents' feelings as well, it, which is a real, it's just a real disconnect and turns everything inward into a really narcissistic place. Uh, and I just found that really fascinating that that's promoted as kind of comical, that the teen was 
just worried about how it would reflect their freedom, period. So I thought that was a good place to start with this talk today because punishments and rewards are not all they're cracked up to be by, by any means. They're not something that um, I promote. And I want to share with you what I do instead. I think when people first hear about this philosophical perspective, some people call it radical unschooling. That's the title of my book. Some people call it peaceful parenting. To me, um, whatever, you know, take what works and leave the rest from what I share with you. I, I do have pretty radical views about parenting, but even if you can get a little bit that might influence your life if you work with young children, um, please, please apply it and understand that my main focus in my work is children's rights and freedom. So that being said, it's interesting. I wonder, have you, has anyone seen the commercial, the Subaru commercial? I don't know if they have it up here in Canada. One person has, that's good. I'm going to write to them, actually, and share this, and hopefully it'll change a view or two. So 99% of parenting books on the market today are focused on meeting the parent's needs. That's pretty crazy when you think about it. Uh, doctors, experts, the generations before us, friends. The focus on parenting is on the authoritarian paradigm, which is based on behavior modification and control of children. And the main focus is the parents' needs for compliance, the parents' needs for uninterrupted sleep, the parents' needs for obedience above all else. And has anyone ever seen uh, the shows like Nanny 911, Super Nanny, those kind of TV shows, or heard of like more gentle parenting approaches? Because I think a lot of you understand the damaging of spanking. You know, I don't know where I'm meeting everybody here at, in their belief system, but spanking is damaging and pretty agreed upon by most people, I think, in this particular community of awareness. But what I want to share with you is what is just as damaging are things like timeouts and any kind of punishment, no matter how gentle it might seem, and, and I can share why. What I want to share with you instead of the authoritarian paradigm and focusing on the parents' needs and um, pulling you away from the idea of the goal of parenting and the role being behavior modification. That is very similar to dog training and how we are told to treat children and raise children. And the greater intention, the reason why that's done, parents are trained to train their children. This doesn't come naturally to us. We're, we're, if we were just gave birth on an island and there was no outside influences, punishments would not come natural to parents, but you're trained to train your children by those that are training you, that want the same thing from you. So I think that's really important to understand that this is not natural, this is conditioned. You're, most people are conditioned to parent in a way that makes it easier and benefits those that are trying to control us. Can I grab some water please, Jaya? I can, I can get it myself. You got okay, thank you. This is pretty early for me to talk. I think this is the earliest I've ever talked before. <laughs> it's early for me to listen. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. Well, that's good. So we're all kind of out of it. I usually have two coffees, but I'm on one, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you for understanding. <clears throat> So I think that's pretty important for people to realize, and it can feel, and interestingly enough, it can feel, um, people have very intense reactions to hearing that the authoritarian paradigm is what's paramount in our culture, it's what most people do, and if they were raised that way, sometimes it can trigger deep resentment to somebody promoting it. I have a lot coming at me all the time. People really either really love what I offer or they resist it and they hate it. So whatever you feel toward me, if you think I'm crazy, I'll, I'll take it, just it's all good, just it's fine. <laughs> because it's really hard to admit to ourselves if you think that you had a really good childhood. It's really hard to see another perspective and say, wow, like I didn't realize that it could have been better, that I could have, that, how, how damaging punishments were. Um, because people say, oh, I turned out fine. Yeah, but how better could it have been? What, what did you learn? What's deeply within you that you've needed to heal from that you didn't realize was connected to that? So 
Punishments model meanness, which is really important to understand that. So, so the saying, children learn what they live. I'm sure we've all heard that. It's kind of a cultural thing that's said over and over again. Children learn what they live. So if children learn what they live, what are they learning from punishments and control other than power rules? Children are not learning the lesson that we're hoping that they learn by putting them in timeout. Do you really think that when a, children, a child is put in timeout that they're thinking about, ooh, how can I better my behavior next time? If you really think about it and you dig deep and you look back to your own childhood, what were you thinking about when you were punished? I think it's really important. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect example. It warps the human condition. You know, when you're controlled and punished, your, your, your innate desire above all else is freedom as a child. All humans have that. And so when your freedom and choice is at the mercy of adults around you, it warps the human condition because you're trying to think of constantly ways to get around it to have your needs met. Some people don't value your needs and don't think that they're, that they're worthy of even being called needs, but children have needs and desires. And my role as my child's parent is to not be the wall between them and their desires, but instead help them get what they want in life. <clears throat> I've never lived in the authoritarian paradigm with my kids. We've always lived in partnership from birth. And so, and, and my kids, I have four kids, for those that don't know. I have a, my youngest is nine. I have a 12-year-old daughter, a 15-year-old daughter, and a son who's 18. And none of my children have ever been to school, and they've never been punished. None of them. Not once. They've never had anything taken away from them because of bad behavior. They've never, which is incredible, I can't believe I have a child that I, I raised to adulthood. Now, I don't want to stand here and say my kids are, are the most amazing humans as a result of my amazing parenting. They're human beings. I mean, they're, you'd see them on the street and just think that they were like anybody else. The interesting thing about them, though, that I've really found and I'm learning the older they get, that's why I love, I love my advocacy journey because I can really share from a place of experience when in the beginning, I've been doing this for like 15 years, in the beginning a lot of it was ph philosophical. Um, I would learn from other parents who, who maybe have done this, or I truly, you know, I truly believed in the philosophy, so I would come from a place of projection in a way of saying, this is what's going to happen. Um, but, but now, I've really seen it. There's a um, time I remember with my son, who's 18, I think he was like 13 at the time, he had a friend over, a neighbor boy, and they were jumping on the trampoline out back of our house, and it had one of those safety nets around it. And the little boy was, the neighbor boy was jumping, and he held onto it, and he broke it. He broke the net around it, and he panicked. And he said, don't tell your mom, don't tell your mom. And my son said, why? She's, she'll help us fix it. <laughs> like, I don't understand. And he's like, oh, please don't tell, because then she'll tell my mom, and I'll be grounded, and she won't let me watch the movie I want to, and I'll have TV taken away. And I'll never forget that point with my son, the confusion that the boy was afraid, panicked, of freedoms being taken away. I found that really telling. That was one of the first times my, my because seeing my children's reaction to children raised in the authoritarian paradigm who were punished is fascinating for me to like watch them observe it. <clears throat> and he said, my mom will help us. What are you afraid of? I don't understand. And he said, no, no, please, I gotta go home. I gotta go, just please promise me you won't tell your mom. Well, my son came right in and told me. Because he was like, what's wrong with him? Like, what's up with that? I don't understand. Why is he so afraid? And I said, well, the, when the focus is on behavior, he broke it, and the parent then has to go through the motions of how can we, you know, I would have gone out there and asked him to help me. It, it's not like I wouldn't have involved the boy. I would have said, hey, okay, you broke it. Let's fix it together. Do you need help? What do you need for tools to, to hang that back up there? How can I help you? But instead, what happened was completely neglected and ignored. Again, a really narcissistic place. Our trampoline, we and my, I think my husband ended up fixing it, but the boy took no responsibility for it. Just na And naturally you would. By nature you would take responsibility for it. You'd wanna help somebody if you made a mistake, but because of punishments and, and your freedoms, like you're, you're standing on the brink of, of your own freedom, it does not allow you to ever feel empathy or compassion for others which is what we're trying to cultivate, especially 
this group of people who are on the forefront of trying to encourage empathy and compassion. Punishments do the exact opposite. So my son actually never invited the boy back over. He was kind of confused and freaked out by how the whole thing <laughs> went down. Um, but I just thought that was a really interesting experience. <clears throat> There's so many stories going through my head with half an hour. I want to pick the best ones to share with you all. Um, so what happens? When we raise children with punishments and rewards, what you're modeling to them, they then go out in the world and do. They continue this behavior, which is exactly what most of us have come to understand and have come to. Like, I think it's important to hear from other people. I really would like to open the forum for questions because the individual questions based on this topic are what's going to help you understand it deeper. And I want to cater the talk to your needs and your, your interest in what this is all about. So has anything come up for anybody while I've been speaking? Hmm? That's a great question. Um, there's natural boundaries all around us. Can you give me an example? No, my kids have never had a curfew. And any kind of behavioral boundary, like you can't do. Um, well, I think what the way that I'm interpreting what you're saying, when you set a boundary, you have to set generally a punishment. So if you're saying if you do this, then this will happen. Or a reward. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you know that both punishments um, and rewards and praise are controlling? Let me explain why, if you'd like to hear. <clears throat> Praise is like seduction. It's interesting when it's artificial. It's all about intent. Now, we have authentic praise that we give each other, just natural praise that, oh, I really loved your talk. I, I love this event. Giant is wonderful. What do we do to children that's not the same thing? It's internally motivated to meet the needs of the adult. It's not for the benefit of the child. It's for convenience of the adult. It's a good job, so you get that same behavior next time. It's, it's very, again, a narcissistic approach of meeting the parent's needs only, so it's in that authoritarian paradigm as opposed to the partnership-based paradigm, which would be an authentic form of communication of authentic praise because people will hear that about the negatives of praise and say, oh, don't you ever compliment your kids? Well, yeah, just like I would my friend or anybody I loved authentically not to get something from that praise. So when you hear parents on the playground, it, it's really hard. It, it becomes like a tick for people to get in that mindset because you know, I give people credit because they want to move away from like super punitive discipline. They want to move away from spanking, but then they shift to this more kind of candy-coated, just good job, sweetheart, over and over again. Have you ever been around a parent who constantly says good job? It's like dog training. And you know what, when a child hears that, when a child hears that, sticky sweet praise, they think to themselves, this must be something I don't want to be doing. Because if they have to bribe me to do it with this praise, it's, there's, some, there's something under this. And so you do not have to bribe children through praise to authentically motivate them. If anything, it'll do the opposite. Yes? school which uh, uh, believes in what you are saying called the mm -hmm. Sudbury Valley School. Are you aware of that school and is it still yes. in existence? There's several of them in the country. There's one in Massachusetts near right. where I live. Right. I forget the name of it actually. It's called the Sudbury, Sudbury Valley School or something. Yeah, there, school, yeah. There's a book, um, yes, there's a couple Summer of Hill. Yeah. And uh, there's another book by Harry Brown called uh, How I Found uh, Freedom in an Unfree World. Yeah. Mm, okay. uh, it also talks about the same thing. In any case, I completely, totally agree with what you're saying. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that's, I'm so glad you brought that up. Sudbury Valley Schools are the closest thing to unschooling. Are all of you familiar with what unschooling is? Let me just share this really briefly. Unschooling is not not educating. What unschooling is is not doing school. Most people that homeschool, 99% of homeschoolers statistically right now, they do what schools do. They, they have the same mandatory curriculum. They basically take everything schools do and just change the environment and location. They do it in their home as opposed to doing it under the roof of school. Some people, I mean, I guess it's one step better for some people, but sometimes it's with the intention of more control, depending on the intention of the parent doing it. A lot of times for religious reasons, for example, that can be even a more controlling, damaging environment for some, for some kids. Um, 
Unschooling is just not doing school. So I'm not doing, I don't want to, I don't want to replicate a broken system. There's no way I'm going to take that and put that in my home. Instead, what unschooling is, is your children learning in freedom. So um, I really recommend reading the book, any book by John Holt. He came out with books in the 70s that's influenced a lot of this, these ideas and concepts. It's about internally motivated learning. I'm very much against forced learning. I don't think that forced learning is just. I think it's abusive to force another person to learn something that you think is good for them. I don't believe that we're all meant to learn the same things in life. We all come here with different strengths and passions. And what I do, instead of forcing my child to learn something that they don't want to do and making them sit and do book work or busy work, workbooks, my children have never done a workbook page. They've never done any kind of school work at all. But yet, they know how to read and write. They communicate like anybody else. My son, who's 18, is a blacksmith, self-taught. But let me share with you, the catch is, this is not for the lazy parent. <laughs> it's a very hands-on role, extremely. So I'm my child, instead of my child's teacher, I'm not standing in front of them pouring knowledge into them as the all-knowing authority. I'm their learning facilitator. So if they're interested in something, I bring as many resources into their lives as possible to learn and grow from based on an interest. We don't live life broken down into subjects. I'm never saying ever, like, this is reading, writing, and math. We've never pulled out of context subjects. There's, there's so much brainwashing that, we're all, that we've all been through that we think that that's the way it should be done. We value certain things over others because of our conditioning in school, because we're told that is what's of value. That's what's fascinating to me, is people don't realize that. Um, we do not break life down into subjects at all. They just live life. But I will share with you, just for the sake of you understanding, if you were to break our life down into subjects, in the way I do facilitate their learning, it does touch on everything. So um, when my child, one of my children, I think it was Devin, my oldest, when he was like four, he was really into Legos, loved Legos. So I subscribed to Lego Magazine. So using the passion and interest as the nucleus of your child's learning, you bring as many resources into their lives to learn and grow from based on that one interest as a nucleus. So Lego Magazine, that was the written word. He was internally motivated to read, to learn to read. He really wanted to learn more about it. I would sit and read to him. We brought him to different exhibits in New England about you know, Legos. We made Lego cakes. We got into math because the measurement and the baking and everything that went with making Lego cakes. I didn't even know there was a such thing, but they're really cool. They have Lego cake pans that you can like stack and make these really neat things. So um, I think it takes a parent to get really excited about your child's passions, but that's not hard. When you love somebody and they're into something and excited about something, doesn't it excite you too? Their passion's infectious. So when you have a child and you're, and you're unschooling as opposed to homeschooling, you get so into it, it's really fun, and you learn as a side effect of, of their learning. So that is what unschooling is. It's focused on educational freedom. Yes? Well, it's almost the theory of Maria Montessori. Montessori school. Similar. And also, your theory is schooling, the way you brought up your children. How was it how you were brought up? I would just like to know how okay. does that tie in? Yeah, I was raised traditionally. I went to public school. I did really well, straight-A student. I never, in junior high and high school, I wasn't happy. I did not like, I think that's when you can really tell you're being controlled. When it starts to feel extremely unjust to have to raise your hand to go to the bathroom. And I had no interest in what they were trying to teach me. Because I had such an inner drive for my own evolution and growth to learn what I wanted to learn, I was so interested in so many things. I was really interested in the ocean, and learning to play guitar and music, like a lot of teens are. And I wanted to pursue so much that I didn't have time for because those who had an agenda <clears throat> wanted me to do what they wanted me to do and then homework. There's no time left to pursue who you are. So there was that time where I really reflect back on those years when I was in junior high and high school as to how to pull my feelings out and, and share with others because I know a lot of people can relate and say, how can we make this better for teens and, and just come from a place of empathy. I, I've been educating teachers lately, high school teachers. I do private coaching, and I've done interviews with, um, with high school teachers who are really interested in how to apply more freedom within the confines of this institution that's being just as controlling with them as they're told to be with the kids. So there's a rumble there. I mean, teachers don't want to be forced to do what they're doing to kids. They really don't. So I try not to vilify them. That can happen. 
in this movement. Um, yes, you were, you had your, yeah. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Um, what do you think about Waldorf education? That's mm -hmm. my very first thing. And the second question I have is, how do then children become university ready where these expectations are rampant and a lot of the different um, expectations for the different disciplines are mandatory to mm -hmm. be able to perform? Great question. Waldorf education, it's funny, it, Waldorf education is really romantic, like in the beginning when you have little kids, because it's so beautiful. For those of you that are not familiar with uh, Waldorf education, Rudolf Steiner out of Germany came out with it, um, the concept in the 1800s, I believe. I don't know exactly when, but it's based on just using the natural world, natural elements. And I'm a naturally minded person. So it, I was really drawn to the aesthetics of Waldorf. In fact, we have a Waldorf wooden toy business. That's what my husband does for work. <laughs> we make Waldorf toys, so I'm very familiar. But I will tell you that it is no better than a public education when it comes to forced learning. Just because it's a different curriculum and just because the toys are sticks and rocks and wool felt and you're felting and making homemade soups in the kitchen, which is all beautiful and very nurturing and loving, it doesn't matter, the damage is still there if the child doesn't want to be there. So it all comes down to choice. If a child doesn't want to be in a dynamic that they're forced in, the damage is equal. It's just as bad, no matter how beautiful and pretty and how many trees are coming through the classroom. So I do want to share that, that this, it's on the edge, you know, for me personally as an advocate, I, I don't like to lean on the anti-school focus because I like to really speak out what I'm for as opposed to what I'm against. There are so many wonderful people in the anti-school movement. My friend John Taylor Gatto, um, he endorsed my book. He's, a, he's an amazing man. If you haven't read any of his work, I encourage you to read um, Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. He was New York City Teacher of the Year for four years in a row, and he lives in New York, and He's an amazing man, very uh, influential to, to me. But he writes a lot. I mean, all of his work is anti-school because he was on the inside. He knows the intention of why schools came to be. So, why is that? well, it's based on the Prussian model of conditioning factory workers initially. Do you know that when public schools started in the end of the, I think it was the end of the 1800s, it was... It was compulsory education, and parents, the kid, children were forced to school. 80% of parents didn't want compulsory education, 80%. I read that they were forced by gunpoint to send their children, and they did. And we've been so warped since then to think that that's what we're supposed to do. It's twisted. When you, when you read the history, it makes sense. So really, dumbing us down, and also the history of uh, public education, I think he wrote. If you, if you do a search for his name, I really encourage you to educate yourself about why schools came to be because I think then you'll understand more the intention of being on obedience and dumbing us down, keeping everybody in, in mediocrity. That's why the curriculum's the same. That's why a child can't advance in something, generally. So that might be helpful to understand why. Yes? Maybe I don't need that. Okay. Uh, one of the aspects of this that may, maybe you can touch on is insularity, I think it's called. Um, it's being an island, and from two, two points of view, one, a child at home with uh, less interaction with other children in school, and uh, number two, the point that uh, in the past, uh, old societies, up until quite recently, uh, was, were composed of a number of uh, mostly women in the in the village, that they all contribute contributed to the education of a child as uh, as it went along. So if you're if you're devoid of any contact with other parents, other people, how how is that made up in in the scheme of things? Wonderful. I'm so glad you brought this up. It's important. People bring up this is the number one focus that people have when they're curious about it. <clears throat> I think the idea that children that are homeschooled or educated outside of school, the fact that they're in, they think that they're home all day, kept away from society. My children are out in society every day connecting with people of all different ages. Their children in school are in a brick building all day, every day for 12 years, age segregated. Do you know how unnatural and damaging age segregation is? I want you to think about that for a minute because it's, it's a big deal. 
the fourth graders associating with the fifth graders? Are you kidding me? Most fifth graders aren't going to talk to the fourth graders, especially when you get into high school. A senior is not going to date a sophomore. It's, it's very damaging to clump children in an unnatural environment with, with their age mates. In a natural context, as people that live their life are living, children don't connect based on how old they are. They base their relationships like we do, like all humans are meant to, based on common interests. Now, it's very, it gives your child a really small world when they're conditioned with age segregation, when they're not anyone as a potential friend. When Devon was about eight or nine years old, he used to walk to um, a woman's house, an elderly woman down the street, and she would teach him how to bake bread. That was his friend. There was no, it didn't matter the age at all that she was. My children can choose from any age group, which is, which is fascinating to see actually unschoolers because at a conference, they're all spending time together. They're not, they're not clumped by age, but it's a really unnatural thing for kids that are age segregated. So that's one thing important that I want to share. Um, I really want to go back to the college question because you, I didn't answer that. <clears throat> I, I know we're almost done. Okay. Ten more minutes. Oh, good. Okay. I love more time. You never hear that when you're a speaker. <laughs> more time. Yes. I thought I had five. Um, I encourage you to Google unschooling in college. I want to share with you that my son, Devin, who is 18, he came to me, uh, I don't know, eight months ago and said, I, I want a high school diploma. And I said, well, I can just write you one. We homeschool. Any homeschooler parent can just write, here is your high school diploma from, for homeschooling. Yeah, you graduated, just to have that piece of paper. And he said, no, I want, I want like a regular one. I want to prove to the world that I can do, that I can get one, just like anybody else. And I said, well, what about a GED? I mean, that's what a lot of unschoolers do. They get GEDs. He said, no, 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 those are looked down upon. He said, people in prisons get GEDs. I want, I want a high school diploma. I said, all right, well, wow, this is, let me look into this. So I did a lot of research. And I found an online distance school out of Virginia that would come give him a test for his high school diploma. So for $90 and uh, an appointment, he, she came over. My, my son's girlfriend um, and her family live in Virginia, so he went down there and stayed with them while um, this happened. She came over, gave him the test, and he didn't study for anything, has never taken one class in his life just off the cuff took the test and scored above average on everything and got his high school diploma. Just like that, a valid, impressive school, the Arch Academy. How long was he down? He said like an hour. He wanted that. It was interesting because I was a little triggered with his request, I think initially. I'm like, well, why would he want something that you know, that, that I kind of speak out in my own head. I had to process it. We're challenged walking this path as parents because your children are, they're such free thinkers. And his process in wanting one, at first, I was just like, well, why isn't it good enough? I didn't say it to him, but my inner process was, why isn't it good enough that I just give him one? Does he, does he not think that we did a good job? Why is he valuing this more? And he said, Mom, I just wanted to prove it to the world that this works, that this life works, because look, I have the equivalent. These kids spent 12 years in school, and I just did it in an hour, and I lived a life of freedom, doing what I want, pursuing passions. I'm a blacksmith. He has an Etsy store where he sells knives and swords. He's a craftsman, and he taught himself how to do that through self-motivated education. Right now, he's, I hate to label him a blacksmith. He tells me that he's multi-professioned, that, that that's like the leading edge of... Of, of thought with, with kids in this movement. He doesn't want just one profession. He's also making games. He's a game maker. He taught himself how to code. That's pretty much all he does. He lives and breathes coding right now. Um, but I was really moved by that whole idea that you could just go. I was blown away that he went and took. I was nervous about the high school diploma because I'm like, I know he has his strengths and weaknesses. I know he, that he would soar at the, at the math portion. He definitely has that kind of mind. But, but reading and writing, well, reading, he does great. But writing, he, does, he hasn't ever written a book report in his life. He's never written an essay. He's written a lot, though. But what does he write? Things he wants to write about. He would start off writing to people that he would admire. 
you know, like fan club type of letters back and forth and texting. And um, he's used the written word for as long as I can remember. He's gotten more practice with the written word. But every step, every age that my children get to, it's really empowering and exciting that I'm constantly challenged for my own process of thinking and rethinking that, oh, how is this going to work out? And wow, that worked out amazingly. So unschoolers can go to college. Many are in college. There's some in Harvard right now. There's, if you want to go that route, based on what I shared before, if a child is internally motivated, so you're all here because you want to learn about what everybody here has to say. No one's forcing you to be here. If you were forced to sit there, picture yourself in school when it was something boring. All of your faces are lit up and looking at me. You are internally motivated. You want to learn what I'm sharing. And that feels good. It's such a good exchange. If somebody forced you here against your will, well, maybe there is the odd spouse that's forced here. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> if you are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're here against your will. But you don't learn in that context. You don't have these faces. If a child wants to become something that requires higher education, they will take to it and learn it joyfully. And they will go on to do it. So that's the point I want to make, is they will take the necessary steps to do so. OK? Thank you. The, uh, the thing that occurs to me, as being a, a normal parent, having gone through, although uh, punishment tended to be uh, personal disappointment with bad behavior rather than uh, anything physical. Still, children start off as very self-centered. Uh, they start off with very little understanding of other people's rights. So my question is, how do you deal with that transition? So you have a, a two-year-old, they may decide to start biting people mm -hmm. or hitting or various unacceptable behavior. What do you do with that behavior? Well, instead of punishing them, either harming them or shaming them or, or sending them away from people like the timeout, we talk about it, we explain it. I think it's, a, it's really important to, to understand that different ages have different requirements. With a two-year-old, distraction is a great tool. You redirect them and explain that hurts so-and-so, please don't bite, and you go from there. But you need to be present. Rules are a replacement for being present with your children. That presence is the answer. You need to be there to make sure everybody's safe. And that's the important piece that's missing, I think, with traditional parenting, is we feel if you have a rule, you have to back it up with punishment of some kind. And we think that that's what keeps children safe. We're too busy doing our adult things that we just set the rules. If they break them, they're punished. That's, it's easy. It's not pleasant or joyful. It makes parenting really something it shouldn't be. Parenting is supposed to feel good by nature. It's supposed to be a joyful experience. We're not meant to control other living beings all day, every day. We're not. It feels bad. But we're told by those that control us that it's supposed to feel bad. We're told it's tough love. This is how parenting's supposed to feel. Buck up. You got to do it. That's what it's all about. Do you know how manipulated we are being told that? Because they want to control us. Because if we think that with children, then we're going to think that with those that control us. It's just a natural, oh, there's so much I could say. I need to come back and speak for like four hours next time. <laughs> well, because there's so much to it. There's so much to both pieces, the parenting side and the educational side. I have to make a comment. In the book, sure. it says that children don't want to, for example, study mathematics. Doesn't matter. At 13 or 14, they suddenly develop an interest, mm -hmm. and they do in one year what it has taken the rest of the kids 14 years to do. They learn more in one year than their other kids who are forced to do it in 14 years. Yeah. And as far as going to university is concerned, again, no problem. They have found a way to get to the university because they're so good otherwise. Beautiful. I read a study that said three months it takes them to learn an entire school career of math when they're 16, 17 years old. But one thing I want to point out with what you said really quick. Reading, writing, and math are all tools to help us get what we want in life. What human being wouldn't want to learn these tools for that unless they're forced against their will? When you have real context to use math. When you need math, when it's a useful tool, you will learn it and you will use it in that moment. When it's pulled out of context and put on paper and we're forced to do these drills, 
we, be, we shut down. It limits learning so much for the, and damages you for the rest of your life, whether you're labeled uh, behind or gifted. You are lo locked into that space. And I, I still think I'm bad at math. Would I have been if I didn't have that conditioning? I, I think I'm bad at math. I still don't like to do numbers. I just, you do it. I, I don't want to know. You figure that out because I'm bad at math. I, I've, all, I've shut down my own learning. I'm trying to open that up again. But that's what happens when learning is forced, there is that damage. How many of you think you're bad at math? <laughs> you're probably not. You're probably not bad at natural math. You're bad at being forced to do math against your will. And it's conditioned you to believe this thing about yourself that's probably not true. I have a okay. question uh, sure. related to the subject of internal motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, you touched on that. And it's great if a child or adult student has internal motivation. What happens to those who don't? Well, how would somebody not, unless you're, you're, what I'm saying is, if somebody doesn't have internal motivation to do what somebody else wants to do, that, that, that would be understandable. Everybody has interests. I've never heard of somebody not having an interest in something. Do you know what I mean? So maybe just share a little bit more about your question, because I want to dig deeper and help you understand more. But um, how how would that how could you envision that? Okay, I'm happy to share that with you. I've never seen a child ever that did not have an interest in something. We're humans. We're meant to. We're drawn to things. So internal motivation to learn based on their interests. It's impossible for that not to happen. Unless a child was sitting in the dark all day every day by themselves. It's natural. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>